All right, we're back. It's another Carolina podcast with Chris Clark and Wes Mitchell. I'm your host, Pearson Fowler, here to break down the first four days of camp. We're recording this on a Wednesday. South Carolina has its first day off today. Yesterday was their first day in full pads. Tavian Feaster is now practicing with the team, so everything's kind of happening right now. It's really exciting. We've heard from Kyle Krantz. We've heard from John Scott. We've heard from Thomas Brown, and we've heard from Bobby Bentley. We will continue to hear from the assistants, obviously, throughout the course of the preseason. But Wes and Chris are here because they get to watch the first 15 minutes of practice every day, which, as we mentioned over the course of the last podcast, yeah, not even every day, but some days. And we mentioned this last week. That's usually when Carolina practices all their trick plays and gimmick formations. So you guys have a lot of insights (laughs) about what's gone on in the first four days of practice. So let's start with what I think people are most interested to hear about, and that is Tavian Feaster's presence in the South Carolina locker room. He got to campus on Saturday after not being able to report with him on Thursday, not being able to practice on Friday, just awaiting NCAA approvals, which was, you know, just sort of a matter of paperwork. But he's now with the team. Wes, you took a photograph of Tavian Feaster. Proof that number four, which he's wearing for South Carolina, You did not like my photo, though. Well, okay, so you kind of – you pointed out, you're like, yeah, here's a picture of Tavian. And I would have just scrolled by it on my Twitter feed. And I would have been like, cool, Tavian's, you know, wearing pads. He's at practice. But you were like, it's really blurry or something. And I was like, if you're going to call attention to it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toast you on this. And so I just simply asked the question, did you take this on your flip phone? Did you? No. That's, you didn't? It's an iPhone. But it's an iPhone. What, is, is the camera screen cracked or something? It was a blurry phone. You, need no, to leave, well, you just need see, to leave that to Katie. See, actually, if you would actually come watch a little bit of practice, Ooh. you would see that um, there's a line that you cannot cross. So unless you have a camera with an actual zoom, mm-hmm. not like an iPhone zoom. Like you know, a little attachment you stick like on an, the back. Yeah, like an actual zoom, then it's it's pretty difficult. But I figured as much as we all have talked about Tavian Feaster, then the people would rather have a blurry photo than no photo, photo Absolutely. At all. <laughs> well, or you could do what your colleague over there, Chris Clark, did, which is take a video. Four like, seconds. Yeah, Tavian yeah. Feaster taking a handoff. I think that that video is probably going to challenge Helensky throwing into a net in terms of total views uh, over under like yeah. two and a half billion. <laughs> Something like that. I'll be curious. I, I, I think the Helensky video got more. It had a bigger ratio. You know, had a lot of replies, you know, Heisman winner and things like that. Right from the jump. I mean, that was Heisman net contact. And if we want to do the yeah. same Zapruder style analysis of the Tavian Feaster, I mean, I've I've never seen a guy take a handoff so cleanly. Like, I mean, that's that was Heisman level handoff reception. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, our man Kevin Roche weighed in, of course, <laughs> and and famous famous man on Twitter. Yes, and and made a comment about how Tavian housed that uh that handoff. <laughs> well, he, he wasn't Nobody tackled. Good ball him. security. Thomas Brown hit him with that big pad. Held on to the football, so. All right, well, yeah, but, but, but seriously, I mean, I, they, they haven't scrimmaged yet. Mm-hmm. First scrimmage is Monday, um, closed, but they do have a scrimmage on Monday, and I, and I think, um, you know, that, that'll give the coaching staff and then by proxy us, you know, a better uh, idea of where things are at with Tavian and the rest of the team. But, you know, the early returns probably have heard some of this too, Wes, is that, you know, Tavian's adjusting well, and um, he's impressed the staff with his work ethic. And, um, you know, he's a guy that gets north-south. You know, he's got speed. And uh, in the early going, with as much as you can tell right now, he's still getting adjusted and things like that. But he's he's done a nice job so far. I, I was talking to a few people over the weekend just about that had watched Tavian play. You know, obviously we've seen him play, but maybe on a more consistent basis. And um, it, it actually echoed uh, – Chris had an article where he got different takes on, on him. And, you know, I, I thought – what Paul Strelo said, sort of, uh, I think it was what Strelo said about um, how he, he doesn't quite have the burst that, you know, like a, a C.J. Spiller did for Clemson yeah. or an ETN, but when he gets to his top gear, um, nobody's going to catch him type guy. And, you know, I, I'm told he's kind of one of these guys, he's, he's not really going to juke, you know, juke you out of your shoes. He's more of, I think, a one-cut guy. But he does have patience in the hole that he's sort of going to fill his way through there. Um, you you have to give him room to operate. But if you give him room to operate, he's a guy that's going to sort of fill his way through the hole, maybe put his hand on the back of an offensive lineman. And then when it does open up um, and he can actually get into his stride, that's when you can see him make big plays. That that was sort of uh, the, the top, you know, top level speed, top end speed, I should say. And um, his hands have been the things that have been mentioned to me from um, – 
just talking to some Clemson people that have watched him like throughout his career as opposed to just a game here, a game there like I have, um, is that those are his sort of uh, best qualities as a runner. And I think that's an underrated quality for running backs, particularly in this system. It's a lot of zone. It's a lot of RPOs. It's just a lot of, you know, reading actions and being patient. And even though Carolina – you know, has somebody like a Mon Denson that on paper is a good downhill runner, somebody you want in short yardage situations. I think where where Denson has come up short in the last couple of years, like literally and metaphorically, just in terms of not being necessarily the most reliable guy that they can hand it to every time on a third and one and expect to pick it up, is not having that patience, not having necessarily the same kind of vision. You know, we, mm-hmm. we've seen him miss holes or, you know, miss time or, you know, things like that. So for Feaster, again, he's he's an impressive athletic specimen but similar in terms of his measurables to Dowdle I think like five pounds heavier maybe an inch taller but roughly the same but it is that vision and that patience that sort of separates him and I think gives you a lot of hope because again that's a really important part of of what you're doing running a lot of RPOs and running a lot of inside zone and outside zone so that is something that won't necessarily show up on the page but you're right like in listening to people talk about it that has jumped off the page uh, and Thomas Brown the other thing that he mentioned when he was talking to the media yesterday and I read this on y'all's site and by the way if y'all aren't insiders on Gamecock Central right now you need to do that you can use the exclusive podcast code GC pod to get a month of subscriber access for free so you don't miss anything in the lead up to football season that's where I get a lot of my tidbits because as these guys mentioned earlier I don't normally make it out to practice in the morning so I gotta I gotta rely on y'all to, to do all the heavy lifting for me or you do a great get, job um, I guess we can mention you can get a free seventy five dollar gift card. Yes, at this point, I mean, why not? That's uh, seventy five dollar annual subscription, and that yes. also comes with a seventy five dollar Adidas store gift card. Yep, so that's twenty five dollars awesome. off. The the usual price is like right at a hundred bucks. Um, so you get a discount down to seventy five bucks, and then you get sent. It's actually an e gift card, so they'll email it to you. Um, you just go to Adidas dot com once you get the gift card. You can buy anything on there, pick out what you want. Um, Pretty cool deal. I was honestly trying to finagle my way into a free gift card myself, but uh, have not been able to pull those strings yet. That'll yeah. be your end of the year bonus. Yes, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> but in, in in reading, it was one of y'all. I don't remember who wrote it, or maybe it was Colin. Somebody wrote uh, just a good summary of what Thomas Brown had to say to the media, and I'll get some of your thoughts on, on some of the other uh, running backs. But one of the things that he mentioned about Feaster that was impressive is his ability to acclimate, which makes sense. He's a fifth-year senior. He's played a lot of college football Clemson runs a different offensive system than Carolina, but I think some of the principles are the same. I mentioned, you know, the RPOs. I mentioned the zone schemes. So he's going to be familiar with that. The The biggest question for me was how quickly was he going to pick up not only the verbiage um, that, you know, South Carolina is implementing, but, you know, sort of the playbook and the subtle differences that there are between – or not even subtle, but the differences between their playbook at Clemson and the playbook here at Carolina. But it seems like he's picking that up as, as quickly as the coaches could have hoped that he would. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, like you said, Thomas Brown um, applauded him as far as his ability to do that and, and really his work ethic in doing that. But, you know, I, I think uh, the verbiage is probably the most difficult part, I would think, man. I mean, I, I know there's little probably intricacies to all this stuff, but, um, man, it seems like most of the teams in college football, except for, you know, like the outliers, they're all running somewhat similar concepts you know they're all spread out they're all they all have got some form of rpo some zone um you know it, it's a lot of for, for a senior player um i would think a lot of the stuff from a concept standpoint is very similar i would imagine what it's called here maybe you know a particular step here or there or you know just a little um intricacies between different plays is probably a little bit different. And that, that I would imagine, is sort of the hardest part. And just getting used to your teammates. You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe running behind um, one offensive line is a little bit different than running behind another as far as how a play opens up or, you know, how the timing on, on hitting a hole, something like that. And those are things that I think are only going to come with time. Um, you know, like Chris said, they'll scrimmage on Monday. I think that would be very helpful for a guy like Feaster. You know, not just the coaches to evaluate him, but him to start to get a feel for that because um, – you know, there's only so much you can do without actually um, scrimmaging and, and playing. Right, and with that being said, I mean, let's just use that as sort of a caveat to what I'm about to say. One of the other things that I have heard or that we have heard just over the course of the first four practices is Feaster's ability as a pass catcher, or at least how the coaches are projecting his ability to, as a pass catcher. And you look at his stats, and they don't jump off the page. I mean, he basically catches one pass a game, 
And when it was officially announced that he was coming to Carolina, I'm looking at his stats. I'm like, okay, look, he had like 11 catches last year, 12 the year before, something like that. So it doesn't jump off the page. But then you consider that he was playing, you know, a, a lot fewer snaps than, you know, Travis Etienne. He wasn't getting as many opportunities. So the percentage of plays that he was in the backfield and catching passes is probably higher than some of Carolina's backs. Um, and again, it doesn't really matter until we see it in a scrimmage, until we see it in games, because I think on paper, you know, Rico Dowdle after his freshman year, it's like, oh, you know, this is a guy that can catch passes out of the backfield. And he's had some problems with ball security, both catching the ball and with fumbles the last couple of years. So it's all kind of moot until we see it in action. But I think at least that theoretical possibility um, is something else that's exciting. It's, again, especially for a guy that when you get him in space, he's a physical runner. He can run through an arm tackle and then he does have that top end speed to really really make something happen i'm not saying he's going to be debo samuel but it just helps to have one more playmaker that you can count on count on catching a ball out of the backfield yeah and that's been one of his um his strong suits like you said i mean there, there's not a huge huge body of work for a guy who's going into his final season um you know in terms of carries he's got 120 carry game in his career um and then he's got a total of five double digit carry games um but um, he has shown some good things in those in those time periods, and he's also been a reliable pass catcher. You know, um, remember there was one I think against Virginia Tech one year he caught a little wheel pass. I mean, he he's wide open. They blew a coverage, but uh, catches the ball well, and then he's got that long speed. And so, certainly when you look at South Carolina, when you look at their offense, you can go back and, and watch some of the games last year where. I think they missed some opportunities in the short passing game just with having backs wide open. They did a pretty good job of scheming that stuff up. You know, you look at the Ole Miss game, they were pretty successful there. Ole Miss's strategy was to apparently not cover the running back at all in any situation. <laughs> it's a bold um, strategy. Let's see if it pays yeah. off for him, Cotton. <laughs> it did not. It did not. Um, you know, every back every back got injured in that game from – it was Tyson Williams, then Dowdle, then Turner, and then Denson. So all those top three went down. Denson finished the game and ended up having a nice day. But um, I think whether it was not finding the open guy at times, taking some shorter yardage, or just dropping some passes, you look back at the Georgia game, the ball that went off Rico's hands, it's returned for a pick, the game was never the same. That wasn't the, the play that lost the game for sure. Um, but those, didn't help. Th- it did not <laughs> help. Those are the types of things, that the plays that you got to make. And so Feaster's been very reliable with his hands. He's been very reliable in terms of taking care of the ball. Now, he hadn't carried the ball 25 times a game every game or 10 games a season. Um, but, you but know, he won't be he's asked done to do that a here good either. job. No, no. He's I, mean, gonna get, I, he, I think he'll, especially to start the season, he'll probably be asked to carry the ball 10 to 15 times, I would guess. Probably no more than that in the first couple of games, right? It's hard to tell. I mean, you know, if they've got – they, they want to have a couple guys – and and if look if Feaster or anyone comes into a game and he's having a great day, you know maybe you feed him a little bit more. Um, I think one reason they haven't been able to feed a guy or a couple guys is because they've been so inconsistent in the running game. Well, you know, and the I, first three years, I, I think um, the numbers with Feaster don't tell the story, especially as far as him as a pass catcher. Just and it, it's it's probably unfair to say um, that they should have. When when you look, I mean, let's be honest. When you look at what they they were able to do on offense, being Clemson. You know, they were outstanding on offense. Yeah, they don't so, need to do anything differently. They so won a, two national championships. So from a, team, from a team standpoint, it's unfair to be like, well, they should have used him more in the passing game. But <laughs> I would still say as far as his capability in the passing game, he was probably underused if you were just looking at was his skill set maximized as far as how he was used. Um, from a personal, you know, Tavian Feaster only standpoint, I would say, um, you know, you could have used him more in the passing game. And, you know, he I don't know what his senior year numbers were in high school, but I think I mentioned on the other podcast um, last week, I mean, he was a 1,000-yard rusher and receiver as a junior in high school. Um, I don't think many guys hit both of those numbers, um, even if you are a you know, five-star guy playing against kids you're, you're much better than. So, um, you know, we'll see. I, I think that's something that, that South Carolina will probably look to implement more of into their um, play calls is to try to get the ball to the running backs in the passing game because of that ability. And you know what? You can um, that they have a lot of a lot of South Carolina's big plays last year that came out of empty sets um, where you're um, and and a lot of their big plays came off of a handful of play calls. Actually, if you if you look back and um, you know if you look at like the four verticals concept. One of the things with South Carolina 
is that, um, you know, they like to motion their tailback out of the backfield, and then he's out on the perimeter normally just running like a little hitch route or a little bit deeper than normal hitch route um, to try and just hold to hold that cornerback a little bit longer if he's in zone coverage so that the outside the outside receiver other than the running back can get depth on the corner and it creates a mismatch down the field. Um, it's a numbers game. Well, if that running back is an actual threat to catch the football, then it probably changes how – um, you know, if we're getting deeper, it probably changes how an opponent has to defend it. And then, you know, then there's all types of things you can do. If if they start just jumping your hitch route out there and you have a, a running back that actually has solid ball skills, you know, you can run him down the sideline too, you know, and, and actually do some different things there. So I, I think um, having a running back with ball skills like that and hands, um, you know, if you if you get creative enough is is an opportunity for some explosive plays. How does he look? I know, like I said, he's listed as five pounds more than Rico, and I think an inch taller. I think he's six feet tall. Rico's five eleven, and then Feaster's two twenty. Rico's two fifteen. But sometimes five pounds is ten pounds, and an inch is two inches. Does he look about the same as Rico? I mean, you saw him yesterday. I I thought Feaster. This is just from glancing at him, like looking at him. You know, in this short period of time, I thought Feaster looked a little bit longer, like a little bit taller a little bit uh, thinner, and I thought Rico looked a little bit shorter, maybe a little bit thicker. Chris? I was going to say, well, I was just trying to Would you think about it. Or <laughs> I thought Feaster looked thicker. Really? Yeah. Ooh. That was me. Having a thick off here. <laughs> the <ass. laughs> Um <laughs> Nah, that's what I thought. Maybe in the, in the lower body, too. Um, I don't know. We need to do a little comparison on that. Yeah. Compare notes. Yeah, well, and I, I think um, get him to stand side by side yeah. the next practice. <laughs> Take a tape measure hey, out you there. You too. Get over here. <laughs> I, yeah. I think get that uh, how how Daddle responds to all this is just as much of a storyline as as how Feaster plays. I mean, if you if you could have both those guys at their in a healthy Rico Daddle, both those guys at their peak performance, then all of a sudden you're saying, okay, this. It's still probably not like elite, elite running back room, but pretty you're in pretty good shape, I think. I think I would be shocked if by the time the North Carolina game rolls around, Rico's not the running back on the first drive. The, you know, the guy that gets the first carry is the guy that gets the first four, five, six snaps, however many. Um, but I mentioned, you know, 10, 15 carries for Tavian in the first game, first couple games doesn't seem unrealistic. But if you are in a situation where by midseason – you know, you're getting Rico 18 carries a game. You're getting Feaster 14 to 16. Mon Denson's getting another five or six. I think that's probably kind of the healthy balance that the coaching staff is looking for, I would imagine. Um, but again, just given that Rico has the experience within the program, he knows the playbook. I mean, he's going to know the playbook better than almost anybody because he's been here forever because he's a senior. Um, and especially Feaster coming and having 30, just 30 days to, to process it all. It seems like it's going to be Rico. But I would, I, I would, I'll be curious to see, and I would imagine – they're going to try and strike that balance. You know, maybe it'll be 20 carries for Rico, 10 for Feaster, and then basically the rest for Denson. When it seems like A.J. Turner is going to be spending. I mean, you can't get 12 carries a game if you're A.J. Turner if you're also playing nickel for, you know, 35 mm-hmm. snaps a game. So I think that will that that's my guess for how it would probably shake out, at least for the North Carolina game. I th- I'm, I'm curious to see uh, Kevin Harris, though, to see if he makes a little move for number three. I mean, he's been pretty impressive. And we're talking about guys who are built big. That's one. Right. Well, and it's funny because I think it was last week or maybe two weeks ago when we were talking about the crowded running back room. Obviously, you have now the four seniors, South Carolina's three seniors, and then Feaster himself, um, a senior. And then you have Kevin Harris. And uh, I guess we should talk about it, too, in just a second. Obviously, uh, Levante Valentine transferring. Um, and Deshaun Fenwick, who had a red shirt last year. Kevin Harris seemed like the guy that was most likely to get a red shirt because he was a freshman because he could still red shirt. And it's like, well, if he's going to be the fifth or sixth guy, you might as well just red shirt him and get another year of his eligibility. But if he can crack into that top three with Valentine transferring, with AJ Turner splitting time with defensive back, um, and if he can get over, if he can leapfrog Deshaun Fenwick and, and really jockey with Denson for that third spot, I mean that that could be another interesting wrinkle for this. Yeah, team. I mean, and, and you don't you don't want to think you, you got to do this. You got to do what it takes to win this year, but at least 
some percentage of it is you got to think towards next year. All those guys you just mentioned are gone next year, except for Deshaun Fenwick. So next year you're looking at a situation where the two scholarship backs are Kevin Harris and Deshaun Fenwick, both of whom have, have very little. I mean, Harris has no experience so far. Fenwick has a little bit from last season. And then, you know, Denson, Turner, Dowdle, Feaster, all gone. And then you're bringing in Marshawn Lloyd, and ideally you're bringing in one more guy in this 2020 class. So really you're looking pretty short on experience. So you, you would like to have a guy that's at least gotten his feet wet a little bit going into the 2020 season too. And so, you know, if you get an opportunity sometime, this, there's probably not going to be a lot of uh, garbage time this year because of the schedule. But if you can get a guy, not even in garbage time, but you know, if you can get a guy, work him in some situations, Kevin Harris, get his feet wet a little bit. If he's done well enough to earn playing time, I think that's a positive too. We'll let's talk about Levante Valentine. As I mentioned, he's transferring. He was kind of like the seventh guy in the running back room, it seemed, um, at least the way the coach Muschamp was talking from the beginning of the season. He also expressed earlier this year, I think it was back in February, when he put out on Twitter that he had been struggling um, with some mental health issues. And so I don't think this was necessarily the most surprising situation. Um, obviously wish him all the best that he lands in a good football situation and someone that's somewhere that's good for him um, in terms of his mental health. Do you guys have any indication where he might be leaning in terms of a transfer destination? I haven't heard a thing. The, the only thing that I think you can bank on is he's probably going to look to run track wherever he goes. I mean, mm -hmm. that was his focus, more of his focus at South Carolina mm -hmm. in terms of how he dedicated his time. And I think that's just how it worked out because he wasn't here as long. Right. Yeah. And it's, we, we've seen that it's hard for even the best athletes to actually feasibly do two sports. We saw Evan Henson, who was an outstanding athlete, do basketball and football, now focusing just on football. We saw Sean Carson do it. Bruce Ellington's the only guy that I think has successfully done it that we've seen at Carolina and, and been a meaningful contributor in, in both of his sports. It's just, it's really, really hard to do. Dude, I, I think at this point in how everything just works as a college football student athlete, it's borderline impossible. Mm -hmm. Like, you you have to be an incredible athlete to do it. Like, not not even at a high level, just to, to literally be able to do it. You know, for Evan Henson to be able to do it is impressive, but, I mean, I, I think you know, at least in my opinion, opinion, it's, uh, you'd have to say all the time he spent on basketball really sort of took it, not knocked out pretty much any chance he's had at, at stepping in at football. I know tight end room has been crowded, but still, um, I, I think it's hurt, you know, the, the, all the time he put in to just come off the bench some on basketball really hurt his ability to make an impact on football. And I, I think you just look, um, you know, maybe track and football, it's a little bit, maybe a little bit easier to do it. Um, you know, we, we've seen guys do that. Demir Bird, you know, did it when he was here. But, um, yeah, certainly basketball and football or football and baseball, um, to do it at a high level. I mean, I think what Bruce Ellington did, the, the more you, like, see other guys try to do this, just with the, you know, the beauty of hindsight, it's like, more and more impressive what Bruce Ellington was able to accomplish here at South Carolina. Yeah, it's it's really impressive. But anyways, all that to say again, best to uh, best to Valentine. Hope he ends up somewhere where he can run track if that's what he wants to do, and, and just in general be in a, in a better better state of mind, somewhere that's healthier and uh, and better for him. All Gamecock Central podcasts are recorded with Anchor, which is the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place, and you can use it right from your phone or computer. And it's absolutely free. The Anchor Creation Tools will allow you to record and edit your podcast right there on the app so that it sounds great. Then they'll distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts, plus many more. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership with ads like this one. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. We've had three other coaches speak. We talked a lot about uh, Thomas Brown. Did you have anything else you wanted to get to with the running backs? Um, I, I don't think so. I, I mean, I, I thought you brought up a good point, though, or an interesting point about, um, and maybe we hit it in a later podcast, but I think at some point we need to make our predictions on, you sort of already gave yours, who takes the first snap at running back game one and who gets the most carries, you know, whether that's the same person or not the same person mm -hmm. in game one, I, I think would be an interesting discussion. Yeah. You're you're well, leaning well, Daddle on. I'm, I'm leaning Daddle for both. For both. Yeah, we'll save that for closer to the season. Yeah, we can we can have a little fun with that. 
Um, we've had three other coaches talk. We heard Kyle Krantz talk. We heard Bobby Bentley talk. And we uh, heard John Scott Jr. the third. Uh, the thing that caught my attention the most of all after, all three of those coaches' media availability after their respective um, practices or after their practices was John Scott talking about how DJ Wanham is more impressive a football player than a lot of the guys he was coaching on the Jets a couple of years ago, which is that uh, obviously that's a huge compliment to DJ. Yeah, and obviously also... it's probably a little bit of an exaggeration, but you also, I mean, like, Look, I, I'm not. That doesn't necessarily mean oh, DJ Wanham's going to be a first round pick this year and it's going to well, light the NFL on fire. But he didn't need to say that. He could have just been like, yeah, he's really impressive. He's mm-hmm. one of the better athletes I've been around. He could have made comparisons to guys he saw at Arkansas. But he went all the way for the Jets comparison. He didn't need to do that. But the Jets, the Jets had like their top three or four guys were really good. Now he he might have been talking about some of the practice squad guys. Right. Even, if you're as good as an NFL practice squad guy, that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean. That's but, still I mean, a very, he very had small like, percentage of football players. He had like three first round picks mm-hmm. with the Jets. Yeah. It was it Sheldon Richardson, Muhammad Wilkerson? There was another uh, Leonard Williams. Yeah. That's they, one he mentioned. They, they've had some really, so, really strong defenses there, even though they haven't been good until, you know, they got Sam Darnold, who I'm still in on, but that's a, a podcast for another time. But, you know, point is You're gonna do a podcast on Sam Darnold? Maybe not with y'all. I, I gotta I gotta do a Jets podcast. I, I love Sam Darnold. I believe in Sam Darnold. Okay. I mean, not not really. A little bit. You can I, have Alyssa Lang I liked on as the, a guest. I liked the to pick. analyze Sam Darnold yeah. and the Jets. I liked the pick at the time, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hang on to my optimism for that. Just not because I care about Sam Darnold in particular, but I would like to think that I was right, um, and thinking that that was a good pick by the Jets. But that has more to do with uh, ego than football. <laughs> what were we talking about? Oh, Sam Darnold. Wanham. <laughs> we know that Wanham is is a very very important player on the South Carolina defense. Him being healthy is crucial to Carolina meeting the expectations that I have for this being the best defensive unit that Will Muschamp has coached since he's been here at South Carolina. That's high praise. I, I don't know. I, I, again, I don't know what to make of that. I'm not going to like freak out because he said that he's as good as an NFL player. But I mean, have we even been underrating DJ Wanham and assessing his ability as a defensive playmaker? I mean, I don't think. I don't know if we have. I feel like. <laughs> We've always been pretty high on him, right? Yeah, but I mean, like, about... if you if you if I if I ask you know this girl walking by right now with her headphones in what she thinks about DJ Wanham, she's probably not going to know. You know, if you if you're talking about a defensive That's player true. on the Gamecock defense, JC Horn is getting more headlines, Javon Kinlaw is getting more headlines, TJ Brunson because he's been around, and you know, for Wanham, part of that has been that you know he missed basically all of last season or the majority of last season with injury. He just doesn't have the kind of accolades. Is he primed for the kind of breakout season that comes with people not really knowing who you are? I, I would say he has a really good chance at it. I think I think he was on his way last year, and then just it got completely derailed by you know the injury, and that that was game one. You know, um, I believe very early in the second half, and then it really just lingered the entire year. He got back in there a few games, um, you know, Tennessee game. Um, you know, he he came up with a big sack that I think sort of sealed that game for South Carolina, and. Uh, yeah, he I poked think, the football away. On, it was a strip sack. Yep, and I, I mean, I, I think he's a huge part of what they do, and they really, really missed him. Um, actually, I asked him at media day if um, there was still a chance for him getting an extra year, which um, he said that they still had not been told on that. I, I would. So he applied know. for a medical redshirt for last year, and yes. then still hasn't heard. Yes, uh, but he played. He played one, like literally one drive or one snap over like into the five game threshold like his fifth game he got hurt the he got re-injured the uh because he played him for and um but it was like first drive he had to come out so I, i don't know how they would interpret that you know it's over four games by the letter of the law but it's but not if you measure it in quarters well, you don't, though. Huh? You but could, you though. I mean, but you could you probably don't. make a compelling argument for that. So, um, you could say four four games is comprised of 16 quarters, and if X player played fewer than 16 quarters, then, you know, you could make a case for that, I think. That's not how the rule's written. But If I told you that one South Carolina defensive player was going to be all SEC first team at the end of the season, would you take Javon Kinlaw, DJ Wanham, J.C. Horn of the field. Kinlaw is who I'd take. Not the Jets linebacker, D.J. Wanham? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'd probably take Kinlaw, too. Kinlaw has enough preseason hype, too. 
Mm. That counts. That it carries over. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. I would kind of lean Horn. Um, Horn. Horn's a good one. There's a lot. Well, I was going to say there's a ton of good DBs in the league. There's also no a good ton of good defensive linemen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of good defensive linemen, too. So that's a, yeah. So you couldn't go wrong with any of those picks, probably. The the defensive line is, I, I asked Will Muschamp at Media Day about the rotation, if he has a number of guys that he wants to play, ideally, all across the defensive line. Because we talked about it. I can't remember if we talked about it on this podcast or not, but you know, when you're rotating four and five running backs, that's really just diluting the pool more than anything else. You want to have probably two or three, like two running backs and then a third guy. You want to have like four or five wide receivers. Most positions you want to kind of cap because the more you rotate guys in, the more diluted it gets, the less kind of momentum and rhythm they get into the game. But Will Muschamp said he has absolutely no limit. You can't have enough defensive linemen. He's going to play everybody possible. I really want to see how this rotation is going to shake out because they got a lot of top end talent. And then I think a lot of the guys that are going to be backups and getting, you know, 35, 40 snaps this year, guys that were playing 70 snaps last year. And I, I think that is really, you know, the Brad Johnsons, the Aaron Sterlings. I think having those guys be able to play 35 snaps instead of asking them to go 75, 80, 85 is going to be a huge boon for Carolina in a way that's like not really reasonably predictable just based on those guys' skill sets. You know, I think it's interesting. You look at the the front four, and um, you know, obviously, Kier Thomas is sort of still coming back. He's been limited, but um, you know, I expected either him to be the starter alongside Javon Kinlaw, um, maybe Rick Sanders to work his way in there. But um, you know, Kobe Smith has actually heard a lot been, of good stuff about Kobe Smith. He's running with the ones uh, right now. Now, does that change when Kier Thomas gets back? Who knows? But um, you know, if you look across the board, you're talking about. DJ Wanham, senior, Javon Kinlaw, senior, Kobe Smith, senior, and uh, then Aaron Sterling, who is somehow already a junior. Um, or if you want to put another senior on there, I mean, we saw Keir Thomas play on the outside, play that other defensive in spot opposite the Bucks some last year. So, I mean, they could put four seniors out there if yeah, they wanted to. Yeah, you, you have experience now. Um, you have a, a very nice mix of experienced guys that are like sort of your upper-level upper guys in Kinlaw and Wanham. Um, some experienced guys that are like your consistent contributor types like Kobe Smith, Keir Thomas, um, you know, some guys sort of in the middle that we're waiting to see what they can become, I think you'd say is fair for Brad Johnson, Aaron Sterling. And then I think what gets fans really excited is what you have coming sort of waiting in the wings. You're trying to figure out how quickly they can push the guys in front of them. J.J. Anabari, sophomore, who even though he's banged up right now, you know, you look at, Bright future for that guy. Zach Pickens, obviously, bright future for that guy. Joe Anderson, Rick Sandage. Um, you know, you, you have such a nice mix. And, the, you know, the young guys, whereas in the past, Zach Pickens is probably thrown onto the field regardless um, just because you have to play him. Um, he's going to be in there once he beats out a guy who's played more than him. Yeah, you know? I mean, if he if he doesn't get more than 30 or 35 snaps in a game – for the first couple games, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Nope. And if, and if he gets more than that, then that means that's a very he good is thing. a monster. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's not it's not a necessity, which is, I guess the point yeah. of what you're saying, which is fantastic. Um, you mentioned Joe Anderson. How does he look? Does he look like he's he's going to be ready to to go and contribute this year? I, I, I he's a guy that I've heard in terms of his ceiling. You know, it's it's pretty high, but obviously he's got a lot of guys to beat out ahead of him. I mean, they were impressed in the spring with um, his pass rush ability. I got the feeling that you know, maybe even a little bit more than anticipated. You know, they they liked his pass rush ability. His body type is an interesting one because he can really play inside or outside. Um, we saw him, and they, they ran sort of a three-man front the other day uh, in, in one of the practice sessions that we saw, and he was a part of that. So, you know, I, I think you put him sort of in that same category as maybe Pickens, you know, where you sort of, see how he does the rest of this preseason. Obviously, there's a ways to go until they kick it off against North Carolina, and then you got the entire year. You know, you never know what's going to happen from an injury standpoint. You never know, know how he's going to – what he's going to do if he does get any earlier playing time, how he stacks up against some of the veterans. But, um, you know, he is a young guy with a lot of ability, for sure. Is there anything you all heard from Kyle Kranz or Bobby Bentley that particularly caught your attention that you want to mention before we get into a little recruiting talk? Or just anything else that's caught your eye in the first four practices and one in full pads? Um, I, I still, I still think that that the Nickelback battle is a key, key one. Um, you have five guys dropping there right now. Yeah, and I and I think it 
it matches, like, because you're pulling from the corners and the safeties as far as how you fill that position, it affects everywhere else. And, you know, I still, you know, I, I, hopefully I can get everybody. I mean, he mentioned what, A.J. Turner mm-hmm. was repping, um, J.C. Horn was repping, um, Jamie Robinson, Robinson, Shiloh Sanders, and R.J. Roderick, right. I believe, are the five that were mentioned. Obviously, if you had to, Jamias Williams could slide in there. Um, I, you know, I was surprised that he hasn't been in the mix. And obviously, you, you probably can't reasonably rep six guys at nickel <laughs> over the course of practice because five already seems like a lot. But J.C. Horn, he's he needs to be your other starting corner. I mean, he yeah. is your other starting corner, so you would like to not have to play him there. I think Roderick, I, I don't I don't really know what how the coaching staff feels about him. I was surprised. I mean, I guess if he's their best option in nickel, they're going to put him out there. But he seems like a more natural fit at that safety role necessarily than the nickel. So I think they're hoping. It seems like they're hoping that one of Turner, Sanders, and Robinson is going to be ready to go game one. Yeah, and, you know, it was interesting. I had I'd heard over the weekend that Jamie Robinson had already been getting some first-team reps at nickel, which um, doesn't really mean a ton. But, if, you know, if they're already slotting you in there even at times this early, that um, – that means a little bit. And then, you know, Muschamp talked on Tuesday as well, and he was asked about the young guys, and he talked possibly about all of them, but he sort of singled out Jamie Robinson for what he's done at nickel and safety so far. So hearing those two things, I'm wondering, um, you know, could, could a combination of Jamie Robinson and A.J. Turner lock down the nickel spot and allow – you know, the other guys to sort of play. So then you're talking about Izzy, JC, RJ, and JT as the rest of your starting secondary, which I think is what you would pencil in as your best. And if you want to put your best five guys out there, it's probably those four and, I don't know, maybe maybe one of the young guys at this point? Well, yeah, well, you know, I think if 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 Jamie and AJ can be your, you know, at least on par with your best option at nickel, then, yeah, I think – um, you know, like you said, Izzy and JC outside, one of those two guys at nickel. I think RJ Rogers definitely one of your best safeties. And then I think eBay and Jamias are probably battling it out to be the other safety as far as your best five options. Yeah, because apparently I mean I, I when I asked Jamias when we have media avail- availability last week, he said, you know, he he expects to play safety and nickel this year, just sort of wherever it's expected or wherever the, the team needs him. Mm-hmm. But I am I just can't – again, we, we just said it a second ago. They're not going to rep six nickels in practice, but I, I am surprised with the coach's dedication at, at keeping him at safety seemingly. Well, I I think he fits better there, man. I mean, even even his freshman year when he played so much nickel, by the end they were, depending on matchups and down and distance, you could see they were swapping him and Chris Lamonts between, um, you know, nickel and safety at, at times just to – they don't want Jamias Williams matched up in man coverage with massive wide receivers. So, you know, when you're at the nickel and, you know, not everybody has a smaller slot guy only. Like, you're have, teams are going to spread you out even with bigger receivers. And if he's playing free safety, he's more free to sort of roam the field and, um, you know, cover space cover grass as opposed to cover a person so i i think up front also as much as the nickel you're relying on the nickel in some ways to be an outside linebacker as well against the run right. so, which is typically uh, yeah I, I guess i i don't think about it in that respect and that's why they they kind of wanted to put rj in there because he is yes. such a thumper you, get him yeah, you gotta to have a guy that, but, can, that can hold up and tackle and you know if, if they're pulling somebody if they're pulling an h back out there you know blocking jamias williams you know and it's no offense to Jamias. I mean, it's just, you know, physically it's yeah. very tough to hold I, up. I feel like he's a good tackler, though, even though he's small. I, I Especially his freshman year. I remember being impressed on several occasions with his ability to wrap up and just a good fundamental tackler. But, but I, you I, have I guess, to get off a block from right, a 6'5", right. you know, 250-pound tight end. I guess what we've seen from way. this coaching staff more than anything is they're going to find a way to get the best five guys on the field. And if that means RJ at nickel, maybe slide JT over to the strong safety so you can let Jam – play the free we'll probably see that we'll probably see a lot of combinations especially early in the season as they just try to gel um you got a johnny dixon update for me i don't think so my champ said that he flashed yeah you know? he did but he lumped him in with with uh with, with cam and shiloh too <laughs> yeah i mean all those guys they're all different in some ways the the thing about johnny is like i remember 
Wes and I saw him in camp, I think, when he, summer going into junior year or summer going into sophomore year. Can't recall which one. And, I mean, he was really good um, in, in, in camp, prospect camp. He had a knee injury that sort of set him back for a while um, on the field. But South Carolina always kept in communication with him, sort of doubled back. So if if he if he can get back to that form, he's a guy who's got a lot of natural, you know, coverage ability. He's someone that they really liked compared to some of the guys that they've coached in the past. Anything else from Bentley or Krantz that we didn't talk about? Uh, I don't think so. I, I would say with, with Bentley, and it, I think we already sort of knew it, but the high praise for Nick Muse, you know, how mm-hmm. how – how big of a storyline is it, you know, as far as whether or not he'll be cleared to play this year? And I'm just reserving my judgment on that. You're just playing at William and Mary. So that's like, there's guys like who would who would win if William and Mary played like, I don't know. Dude, we're watching South Point from a couple years but, ago. But we're watching don't, NFL training camp right there. Yeah. How many dudes make it to the NFL from just small, never heard from programs like? All the time. That yeah. I don't think that has anything to do with him. Nick, as a player. Yeah, I mean Nick Muse didn't play in the team by himself. You know, I mean like, yes, William and Mary would get slammed by most. Teams. They, Who's they, the best they, high school team in South Carolina right now? That they would beat any high school team in South Carolina for sure. For sure. Yes. For one hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah, we're not we're not going to start all that. Is William? What are they? <laughs> division two, <laughs> division three. They're what, they're they're uh, division two, right? William and Mary. Yeah, they they would beat any high school team by a lot. Okay, what South if you Carolina. took all the best players from South Carolina and put them on a team? They would get beaten. William and Mary would beat them. You're talking about men, you know, a lot of times. Like, have like, you seen Jordan Birch? Like I saw. A man. I, I'll put it this way: I saw Nick Muse in camp this summer. Okay, now he's a, a guy going into his junior year, so that would put him what he's twenty, twenty one years old. I don't I don't know when his birthday is, and I saw. Another couple guys, one guy in particular in camp who's from the 2021 recruiting class. He's a junior, and he has 20, 25 offers. So he would be one of those top, you know, if he's in the state of South Carolina, he'd be one of the top 10 to 15 prospects in the state, maybe top five. In the 2021 class in South Carolina, he'd be top five easy, maybe even the top guy. And Muse blew him away. Now, and and this is a guy that has offers from ACC, SEC schools, so – Yes, if you took William and Mary, like if South Carolina said we need twenty five transfers, let's take all William and Mary guys, they would lose <laughs> a lot of games. They wouldn't win any. But one guy, I mean, Nick Muse had an offer from LSU. You know, so I mean, he had an offer from NC State, LSU, South Carolina. So, guy, you can miss guys. I mean, if if you if you're offering only guys that fall to William and Mary out of high school, you're not going to do very well. But there have been some of those guys that uh I just you know. I don't think I don't think Bentley goes out of his way to to go that far about the praise if there's not something to that. I'm not saying he's not gonna be good. I'm just saying I'm I'm reserving my my optimism on that. Is he if he if he is able to play this year, does he start at tight end? I mean it one. seems like he would be the backup behind Keel Pollard for a lot of reasons. Yeah, see, that's the interesting question because I feel like Muse is more of the Markway role, right? Yeah. And so, I guess it'd be a battle between between him and Kyle Markway for that. And I don't know how that would play out, really. I, I like I get the athleticism, but just it, you know, if we're talking about who's starting and who's playing, I feel like the experience edge. You know, playing tight end, you have to learn the receiver position and you have to learn how to be an offensive lineman. I feel like that's a hard thing to pick up right away. You know, we talked a lot about about Feaster and what it's going to be like for him to learn the offense. And I think that's probably one of the easiest positions to learn conceptually is, is running back because half of your job is, I mean, he knows how to run halfback dive. He knows how to run inside zone. He knows how to run outside zone. He knows how to do those things and what you call it. Maybe that takes a little bit, but again, conceptually it's about the same, but when you're coming in and again, having to basically learn two entirely different and separate positions and, you know, knowing when to do what on what play, I feel like that just, that, that takes a little bit of an acclimation period. So I don't know. I would be surprised, at least especially early on, if he's if he's getting a significant amount of snaps over Keel Pollard or Kyle Markway. But that would just be my inclination. But I've also been super optimistic about everyone on here, so I just need to throw in a little bit of dissent to keep everybody humble because we're still like twenty. What's today? The sixth, seventh. We're still twenty four days away from kickoff. Anything else from practice? That it.
Cool. Wow, that was uh, we talked for longer than like y'all even watched practice combined over the <laughs> over the last that's how you three, four days. So that we're true professionals. Um quick update, Cartavius Bigsby is gonna announce what school he might attend next year. He's gonna do that on Friday. Today is Wednesday, so day after tomorrow. Um y'all don't think he's leaning South Carolina. Correct. Um be be pretty surprised, I think, if it wasn't uh Auburn for Tank. War Eagle. But this isn't the end of his recruitment. No, probably not. You know, I think um, what happens on the field could could play a factor. Auburn, obviously, Gus Malzahn is on the uh, perpetual hot seat, it seems like. It's like just, well, how hot is it this year? It's kind of either lukewarm or, like, super hot. If he just won the national championship, it's lukewarm. Anything yes. else, it's super hot. Yes. Um, man, that, that guy may have the toughest gig in America in some ways. Obviously, it's Auburn. They have – you know, great facilities, all this, blah, 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 blah. But as far as the expectations go and the division they play in, um, it, it's tough. So, you know, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, I think it's Auburn, but we'll see if that sticks. Can we just say that the the two toughest jobs are being in the same state as Alabama and Clemson? Probably true. Carolina fans and Auburn fans should they should be friends. To join forces. Join forces, <laughs> yeah. Combine teams and vanquish Alabama. You're all about the combining teams. Am I? Today? What else have I joined like? forces? You talked about taking the best talent from high school and that, oh, uh, yeah, and that they would beat William and Mary. Yeah, Are, you, do you it, still believe that after our conversation? I mean, I didn't say I believed it. I just wanted to present it as a thought experiment. I got you. I want to know what the, I want to know what the gap is. I don't know what Division Two football looks like. I've never watched Division Two. All I know is I watched Furman and they were one double A, and that was like watching JV football. So I don't know. Thanks, My buddy. Uh, okay, here, here's an example. My buddy Andrew Smith. Who's at Harvard right now? He's the man. He played long snapper in high school. I don't know why. I, I think that's all he did. I mean, he may have played other football. I don't want to. I don't want to disparage Smitty. But I, I did not meet him, and I was like, "Oh, you're a football player." And our senior year, we're sitting. I think we were like at the dining hall or something. And Furman's long snapper got hurt, and the coach found out that Andrew. It's a small school. They're like twenty seven hundred people. Found out that Andrew used to play long snapper. And the coach called Smitty and was like, hey, our long snapper's hurt. We need a long snapper. Can you come play long snapper for us? And he was like, yeah, sure. So he went to practice, you know, got some gear, and then played long snapper for, like, the rest of the season. That's a 1AA school. So my expectations for Division II are, are considerably lower than that. South Carolina pulled a guy out of <laughs> out of the recruiting office in the spring to snap. Yeah. I mean. Really? <laughs> pretty much. Wow. But, I mean, you're also talking about the long snapper. Yeah, yeah, no. That's, this guy, well, they didn't pull your friend from the student body to go play quarterback. Yeah. That's That'd true. probably be something. They had a uh, bad thing. Um, what was his name? Blaze Jowski, I think, was his name. Was from his quarterback. It was an incredible. I can't remember what his first name was, but it was equally cool. Um, all right. So, Tank's going to Auburn. Um, Nick Needs is going to win the Heisman. Uh, <laughs> anything else people should take away from today's podcast? Uh, I think you summed it up. Cool. Perfect. All right. Rate, <laughs> review, subscribe, share with your friends. That helps us keep doing it. We'll be back next week with much more thoughts on practice. Actually, this time next week, we'll have some thoughts from Carolina's first scrimmage. That's Monday. So uh, so get excited. Football is just over three weeks away. Y'all enjoy the rest of your week. We'll talk to you next time.